hey thanks for checking out the video if you all like it please like and subscribe and uh hope you all enjoy it have a great rest of the day Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Walnut Grove, uh, second annual A Soldier's Timeline. Hopefully the weather's going to hold off. It has been good to us so far. Glad you came out today. We'll be firing demonstration at 11 o'clock, all of the black powder time period, our early history uh, from French and Indian conflict, sometimes known as the Seven Years' War all the way through the American Civil War, which we like to call the War Between the States. That's the correct version. Uh, we'll be firing cannon for you. We'll do that last. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to John, who is our militia commander. And you'll see, I'll let him tell you who's represented here. And once the infantry guys fire for you, we'll fire the cannon. Go ahead, John. Well, most of us picked up like the French and Indian War. Down here it was called the First Cherokee War. Cherokee started out on the French side. Some things, incidents happened while they was up in Virginia. They declared war on all the whites. What too many French here. The closest French were in Toulouse, Alabama. So, uh, but uh, the Cherokees were winning most of the battles they fought here because the Europeans trying to fight a European style war. We had to rely on the people in the back country to uh, keep the turkeys down at that time. Uh, we've got uh, one Revolutionary War red coat. The rest of us are fixed up like different militia. One got, got on green, he's a ranger. They would range the countryside. We have an assortment of uh, red rifles. He has rifles. One rifle. Two. Uh, Brown vest or French uh, musket, musket, military musket. We got one fowler. A fowler is a smooth bore too. A rifle gun has actually has rifle and good in the barrel. It's like a modern day rifle. Uh, it takes. Uh, they have better range, but it takes longer to load one. The musket. Uh, it's easier to load. You load and fire a musket three times a minute. It takes about a minute to load a rifle. But the musk, uh, muskets were easy to clean, take care of. Uh, they don't have range about 80 yards, but you can load a ball and shot in there. So we won't be drawing ramrods, so you won't be able to tell as much of the difference in fire here. But uh, they're all flint locks. Rock stick for you, show them how flint locks <coughs> These guns we load either from uh, powder horn with measure or cartridge. <coughs> and private, by loading the pan here, close that. Pour the rest of the powder and your ball or uh, bucking ball and throw, knock it down onto the powder. And turn the ramrod and you'd be ready. That is full cock. You pull the trigger, you shave off a little bit of steel with the flint. It becomes a spark that sets it off here, it goes through the little hole, and that's the gun going off. And then you reload. Keep them on half cock, that's the only safety on this is that half cock. Can you show, show your fire lock? About feet. Load and close the phone. Load. Just take pictures. 
Covered him. Mate, ready? Check aim. Fire. Show your fire lock. Secure your fire lock. Shoulder. About face. You see the noise smoke for men make. You can imagine that cap ends where you have a thousand on each side. The noise and smoke is just making me. Thank you for coming out today. Stay fired. The three of us represent the soldiers from the War Between the States or the American Civil War, some people sometimes call it. A uh, couple of things I wanted to point out to you is this was the nation's largest domestic dispute. You had families split down the middle fighting against each other. Uh, it was a horrible mess. More people killed in this war than all of America's wars combined. Uh, the killing technology of the rifle advanced dramatically from where these fellows you just saw to this point here. And if you look at our uniforms, one thing you notice, they're very similar. Look at the caps. We're all wearing forage hats. Uh, the coats, wool, pants, wool, old brogan shoes. Just a few variations in the color. We're from the north. We're wearing navy blue. He's from the south. He's wearing gray. But you have soldiers at First Manassas with every kind of conceivable uniform color you ever saw. You have people from New York wearing gray from head to toe and people from New Orleans wearing navy blue from head to toe. Stonewall Jackson in a navy blue coat at First Manassas where he got his nickname. Okay, the rifles that we carry, we have two infields. Myself and Devin are carrying infields, which is the second most popular, most prevalent rifle. Most of them came from England where they were manufactured. They started off 577 caliber and then they uh, uh, transitioned to 58 caliber because so many thousands of soldiers, uh, primarily from the north, were wearing, carrying the Springfield rifle musket. 58 caliber. Shoots a slug about the size of your thumb. Okay? Now. Ready? Take aim. Fire. And so this rifle would kill a man at 600 yards uh, accurately. Uh, there were some crack shots from this county and the Palmetto sharpshooters that would wait till an artillery piece was in battery and they would take out two men with one bullet if they were close enough. Uh, they were that good of shots. Okay, the command is uh, uh, to load these weapons is, is you'll get the command load. The musket comes around, fellas, right beside your left foot. They're all practicing this every day doing drills so that it's like a ballet. Everybody's not bumping into each other. You reach into the cartridge box that's on your side and you pull out a 58 caliber uh, cartridge that's been rolled uh, with a 58 caliber slug in it. You bite the cartridge, you had to have two teeth that met, was one of the requirements. <laughs> you bite it, you pour the powder down into the muzzle of the gun. They did this three times in one minute. We're a little bit slow, slower than they are. After the powder's in, the bullet would stay in there with the, uh, they didn't drop the cartridge like we did. And the ramrod comes up, you spin it around and push the bullet and the powder, make sure it's all the way down in the gun. Traditionally, we don't do this as reenactors. It's a little dangerous. It's a battle of Shiloh. Soldiers got excited, left the ramrod in, pulled the gun up, fired, and out goes the ramrod like a spear. They couldn't reload their guns. And so we, we traditionally do not do this uh, with the ramrod. But I wanted you to know that it had to be rammed down. The next thing you do, you come to the, your right hand comes down and you practice this where it was very smooth. You reach into the cap box. You got a fulminated mercury cap out it goes on to the nipple of the gun okay the command is well we're going to about face so to uh, make it safer for you men face by the rear rank march okay they're standing shoulder to shoulder and they fired uh at will sometimes but we're going to fire by files this is so if you got a thousand men lined up based on the tactics taking place in the field in front of you 
you'd have like a big old saw just coming down, cutting people down. Ready? Aim. Fire by files from the right. Fire. Okay. You notice what happened? His went off. Ours did not. The cap fired. And that was a frequent occurrence during this time period and, and during their time period as well. So what you got to do then is you either put another cap on, which we're going to do, draw, and fire again and hope it works this time. That's the way these things were. They're not like modern firearms. Take aim. Ready? Fire. This happens all the time, and you know what? I'm glad it does because that's a key element in warfare these days. You cannot go time out, hold it, wait a minute. You got tools on a in your cartridge box on the front. You have a nipple prick with a little piece of wire that goes in the a vent hole to clean it out, and black powder is nasty. Uh, it it it's easily corrupts the firing mechanism of the gun. So the only other thing you could do. Aside from run, which they did not do, is put this triangular bayonet on. This one was actually used during the war by a man named John Thomas Taylor. His granddaughter gave it to me. It's a triangular bayonet, and, and they didn't like fighting in this manner. They were gentlemanly people, but when you got into the close quarters, you had to do what you had to do. They used this to cook and dig with mostly, but anyway, bloody time period. Thank you for coming today. Again, it's the exact same principle that what you saw there. These are antique weapons. Sometimes they go off, sometimes they don't. Uh, black powder is, is it's, it doesn't do what it's supposed to sometimes. Depends on the humidity, depends on the moisture. Uh, what I will do, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what each cannoneer is. It takes seven, we have six, actually would be helping uh, charge and do the fuses on the limber. This is called a limber. This is called a cannon. When you took the two and took them together, they look like a wagon going down the road. Your horses are beside the pole that you see right here. When it's in the battery for the fire, it's turned around backwards and the horses are facing toward the gun. This particular gun is full scale it's called a Confederate Mountain Rifle. This was used mainly by cavalry units. They would take, because it only takes two horses to pull this. The full size field pieces are very, very heavy. It takes six horses to pull them. And the only braking mechanism that you had was the horses. So very primitive way of moving things around. These guns are very heavy. Um, this one is not quite as heavy, so it's a lot easier to move around. It's the same drill for the for the field pieces uh, as it is for the mountain rifles. Uh, you notice our crew is a mix of blue and gray, exactly just like what the infantry was. We try to represent both sides and show how they dress. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what each crewman does. I'll post them on the gun. We'll go through a drill that is by the numbers which is the way each cannoneer learned their job. And if someone was hit during battle, they had to be cross-trained so someone could fill in for the one that actually was hit. Um, number one, position one from the one right here, is carrying in his hand what's called a sponge rammer. You'll notice on one end, it has got a piece of carpet on it. Or that, that is, there's a bucket in front of the cannon. It's filled with water. That every time you fire the gun, you have to insert that sponge in to wet that barrel 
because your powder bag is made out of linen. So if you have any sparks, the next time you reintroduce another powder bag in there, guess what's gonna happen? So we try to take every safety precaution that we can, and this is actually Patton's drill, which was Colonel George S. Patton, General George S. Patton's great, great, great grandfather, wrote this drill for both armies during the, the war between the states. Uh, the other end you'll notice is the rammer staff. That is actually what rams the charge down the barrel. These are muzzle-loading cannons. They're just like the rifles. They're, you can't get into the breech. You can't put anything in from the back. Everything goes in from the muzzle. Position number two, you'll notice Skip is carrying, what, it's like a corkscrew on the end. That's called a worm. Every time the drill goes through, you introduce the worm into the cannon barrel, twist it, and if there's any part of an old powder bag in there, you want to get it out. It's another safety feature. All right, skip, step back. The number three man is carrying in his right hand, this is a priming wire. You, when you introduce the powder bag into the cannon, you've got a touch hole or a vent hole at the back of the cannon. You have got to make a hole in that to be able to get fire introduced to the main powder charge. That pokes a hole in the powder bag. Now you'll notice on his left thumb, and it's called a thumb stall. And the reason he's wearing that is after you fire this gun three or four times, that barrel gets very, very hot. You don't want anything flaming air in, it's like, uh, the cannon barrel acts like a bellus. So if his thumb is not over the vent hole in the back, you're sucking air in and out of that tube. And if there's flame in there, it's gonna make it get bigger. So again, you try to do everything that is safety conscious. All right, the number four man, this is the glory position. He actually gets to fire the cannon. Uh, he has in his hand, uh, you got a priming, you got a primer, handy? The gun is, is fired with a lanyard and modern artillery is fired with a lanyard. Anybody that, that, that's been in service and been around artillery, you know that. I've got some friends here that's, that's been there. Uh, the little brass piece that you see there is called a friction primer. It's a twisted wire. And after we fire folks, if y'all would like to come up and talk to us, you're welcome to. Uh, you can see this up close. It's a little piece of wire. It's crimped on two pieces of flint and there's flash powder inside of the little tube. So when he pulls it, it strikes the flint, blows the flash powder down into the main charge and hopefully sets off the cannon. So that's how that's fired. The number five man works between the limber and the cannon. He carries the ammunition. Now the ammunition is carried in a leather valise. It's called a gunner's pouch and you want everything covered at all times. Now remember during battle, you would have uh, a battery of artillery would be six guns, sometimes four, sometimes less, depending upon what they had. These guns are gonna be lined up. So you've got fire going on all the time. You've got incoming fire going on all the time. So you want everything covered as much as possible to keep sparks from exploding what you have in your, in your uh, bag. The number six man actually works at the limber chest he charges the rounds, he uh, times the fuses. These, these uh, guns fired fused shells. So the gunner will call out the range to him and he will tell back the gunner what the time of flight is, the degrees of elevation that the gunner needs to raise the tube depending upon what he has seen. This is called a pendulum hoss. So I'll be your gunner today. This is the site that actually, that you put in the back of the cannon and you'll see how we do this. That you actually elevate the cannon to get your range. The only way that you can laterally move the gun is by the hand spike, which is at the, the post you see sticking up at the back. So the only lateral movement is the gunner's sighting it and number three man moves it back and forth and that's how you get your ranging side to side. So without further ado, we're gonna do the first drill we'll do by the numbers. We're not gonna fire. This is just gonna be by the numbers to show you how the cannoneers learned their job. Great load. And I'll tell you then, be prepared. It's going to be loud. If you have small children, make sure they're aware of it. They might wanna cover their ears. 
Um, and without further ado, we'll we'll drill for you. All right. Oh, oh, hey. the numbers. That's how each cannoneer would learn how to do their job. This one will be the live round. We're not going to do anything by numbers. Safely a gun crew can fire their gun about three times in a minute by this drill. Again, thank you guys for coming out today. This concludes the black powder part of our demonstration. If you guys would like to talk to us. Machine gun. Starbucks. A little bit about the weapon they're using, and we'll go outside of the. Uh, canopy to fire but it still may be pretty loud so all right well i'm going to keep this short and sweet 
<laughs> Obviously, as you can tell, I represent uh, your standard American doughboy from World War One. The older I get, the more doughier I get. So that's a pretty, pretty accurate description. We'll talk very quickly here about the iconic World War One U.S. Model 1903 Springfield rifle. This is what we always associate the Americans carrying in the battle. Ironically, few of our troops carried the 03 Springfield than they did other weapons because it was really tough for us to crank out enough of these for everybody to use when we had to triple the size of our army overnight, basically. But at any rate, it represented the standard technology of the time. It's a bolt-action rifle. There's nothing that's going to be semi-automatic. Every time you want to fire a round, you're going to have to push this forward. That'll scoop the round off and then and then fire it. It was a very, very accurate weapon and uh, the envy of the modern world, I'm sure, because it's American. Stuff's always the best, right? Based, and it's also based on what they call a Mauser action. So the whole bolt mechanism, the way it extracts, the way it goes in the battery, is based on a Mauser German design we won't talk about. In the back end. At any rate, so I'll do that right now. What I'm going to do is load a five round stripper clip so you would have, if these were real live bullets, obviously, you'd have tips on the end. But the infantryman would have to put it here in the top of the receiver, which is called the bridge. And then once it's in the bridge, you actually tighten it a little bit. And then you're going to have to push the bullets down with your thumb. And they're all held in here internally, five rounds. Five rounds is all you get. It's not an awful lot. But because you're an American, you're at a crack shot and therefore will hit whatever you're aiming at every time, right? So without further ado, let's go through five rounds, hopefully. Remember, blanks don't feed correctly because they're snub nose. These weapons are made to fire a, a full length bullet, right? And that's the excuse I'm going to use when these things don't feed the right way. All right. Ripper clip. Push the rounds in, hopefully. Of course, somebody's shooting at you when this is going on, so you got a lot of adrenaline, I'm sure. The other problem with the stripper clips is sometimes they get bent and things don't want to feed correctly. But what you're seeing here is probably fairly realistic. Because if anything is going to go wrong, it's going to go wrong when somebody's shooting at you. All right, the rounds are in. We push the bolt forward. Make sure the safety's off. Pick your best stance for an accurate shot. And hold your ear. Pick our target. <laughs> Notice I don't pull the rifle away from my eyes. We're in between. <laughs> that was five, right? Hopefully somebody was counting. There we go. That's the last round. Of course, we make sure that everything's clear before we go back off the line. Want to look at that? Five rounds is all you get. It's not an awful lot. But because you're an American, you're at a crack shot, and therefore will hit whatever you're aiming at every time, right? So without further ado, let's go through five rounds. Hopefully, remember, blanks don't feed correctly because they're snub nose. These weapons are made to fire a, a full-length bullet, right? That's the excuse I'm going to use when these things don't feed the right way. All right. Ripper clip. Push the rounds in. Hopefully. Of course, somebody's shooting at you when this is going on, so you got a lot of adrenaline, I'm sure. The other problem with the stripper clips is sometimes they get bent and things don't want to feed correctly. But what you're seeing here is probably fair. Make sure the safety's off. Pick your best stance for an accurate shot. And hold your ear. Pick our target. Notice I don't pull the rifle away from my eyes. What in between? Hello, my friends. I read out the Italian infantryman in 1944, Italy. I am equipped with a Mauser K98, same rifle as what the Germans would have. They also used the Carcano. 
Italy was in a dire situation really late in the war. They had to be supplied by a lot of German equipment, grenades, some rifles. This rifle wouldn't have really seen frontline service. It would have been part of it pretty much. But I'm um, going to fire it. It's pretty much the same as Springfield. The only difference is it's the original. Good afternoon. My name is Edward Harrelson. I'm representing. Okay, that's not for me, that's for him. Mm -hmm. I'm representing a member of the 30th Infantry Division, which uh, was formed from the North Carolina National Guard as well as elements of the South Carolina National Guard in Tennessee. By World War II, they had a number of replacements from all over the country. I'm armed with the standard military rifle for. American GIs um, from about 42 on, which is the M1 Garand. Early in the war, uh, troops, for example, in the Philippines would likely have been armed with Springfields, but this was the modern rifle for throughout the Africa campaign, uh, all through uh, Pacific, as well as uh, Europe. The um, rifle is loaded, whoops, is loaded from an M block which carries eight rounds. Now these are blanks, of course, so they're a little shorter. With the round, they're a little longer. The M block goes into uh, the rifle here. You push it in with your thumb. This is a pretty heavy spring, so you gotta be careful that you don't get something called Garand thumb, which is when you push it in and the spring slams your thumb closed. So you only do that once, generally, uh, and you learn your lesson. Um, but it should fire fairly rapidly. It's a very accurate weapon. It's a 30 alt 6. Um, so we'll give it a shot. as opposed to the wool uniform like uh, Ed was wearing there. I've got the uh, Thompson submachine gun here. It was designed in 1919 by General John Thompson and it was actually declined by the military at first. So it was marketed to the civilian market and uh, achieved some notoriety during the Prohibition era in the 1930s with the, used by some of the gangsters of the time. It fires a 45 ACP round, which is actually the same round as the M1911 A1, the Colt 45 pistol. The Thompson was uh, exported far and wide. The British used it, and we also exported it to the Chinese and uh, Russia. Let's see, it, it could fire out to about 200 meters, although it was really only effective up to about 50 meters, so close quarters type combat. It could fire from stick magazines. The early stick magazines held 20 rounds, the later ones held 30. And the earlier style Thompsons could still fit the uh, drum magazine, which is what the, the gangsters of the 30s used to use. So I'm going to actually demonstrate both types of fire that this weapon was capable of. It's capable of single shots like the prior rifles, but it could also do a fully automatic fire as well.
the Korean War and the Vietnam War, and of course in the Vietnam. It looks a lot like an M1 Garand. It fires on, it, it actually operates on the same principle, although this rifle was select fire, full auto, if you wanted it to be. Um, it fired the uh, 7.62 NATO round, or 308 civilian round. Uh, as I said, it, it could fire fully automatic. We found out that it, it was pretty uncontrollable in fully automatic. Um, it came with a little buttstock shoulder rest to try and keep the thing under control. And, uh, but it still wasn't much help. So most of those are selector switch here to switch from automatic to uh, single shot. It, for the most part, most of theirs were blocked off and they just ran the thing as a, as a single shot or a, a semi-automatic run. It, was, uh, it fired 20 rounds from a box magazine like this. So I'm going to go ahead and fire 10 rounds out of this thing. Um, and I'll show you how quickly it can it can fire. And that's because these are government blanks from about 1962. <laughs> <laughs> government at its finest. Hi, I'm Ron. I've met several of you already, but uh, I'll point out that Ed, who introduced himself earlier, and Mark and I are all members of the Old Hickory Association, typically representing 30th Division World War II, but we are doing a uh, Vietnam impression this, this time, so we're portraying the 199th Regiment of the U.S. Army in Vietnam in country. Um, so I'm a little bit later than him, the M14, obviously in service from about 57 into the si mid-60s, but it was quickly replaced by the M16. Uh, this is, of course, a civilianized model, semi-automatic only, so an AR-15 basically based. But uh, it fires much like its M16 counterpart from 20-round magazines. So a 20-round detachable magazine. There's also 30-round uh, magazines that came about later. Once you've got it in there, you can fire either semi-automatic or fully automatic. Again, this one's only you're going to hear semi-automatic fire. But it fires a 5.56 five, round, smaller round than the 308 that you just saw. The nice thing about that is this rifle probably weighs about half Mark's rifle did. This ammo weighs way less than half, so I can carry a lot more ammo and carry a lot more gear. So it was a real uh, evolution in, in, in weaponry, especially in Vietnam. We're going to go ahead and attempt to, uh, to fire. I'm a little nervous now following that up, so let's see what we can do. Elevate a little bit, Ron. You better. being said earlier about the, uh, the rifles feeding blanks. They're not designed whatsoever to feed blanks. That's an afterthought. So all these fellows that are bringing all these out here to show the uh, firing and operation of them have to deal with that one more factor that 
a live round wouldn't cost. Yeah, I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you, but I'm sure Wes, who's following up, will do much better. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. <laughs> Many thanks to these guys. I, I actually came in kind of late, and these guys are already planning to be here. So I was kind of like, yeah, yeah, I'll definitely do this event about four days ago. I spent two days this week up at Fort Bragg for All-American Week. Hopefully some of y'all came out. A lot of veterans came out to that, and that was really good. always appreciate that. Um, what myself and my friend Philip over here is portraying are special observations groups members. The uniforms are typically sterile, no markings, no rank, you know, minimize all of that. And we had a tendency to use indigenous weapons like this Soviet made PPS 43. Also in China, it was called the uh, M53 762x25 submachine gun. So. Again, it's blank adapted, so it has to deal with the same kind of stuff that everybody else is with. So, like a safety. Look at that. It looks the same thing as yours did, right? Yeah. And a stove back. Loads of fun, you gotta make sure whatever that light strike was out of here. Yep. Uh, for the Navy. Rain for the Navy right there. Yeah, uh, but sterile, there's no US stamp on it, nothing. And I mean, sometimes that's all you can get instead of a poncho. At a glance, it might, it might be beneficial at a glance, you know? Also, one thing I have with me, since they didn't carry sleeping bags with them outside, they slept in their uniform. The only thing they put over was the sleeping shoes. It was like this. Something simple. Simple, but it was a little bit warm on the inside. And here yeah, it says shirt, sleeping. Okay. Well, not bad. Mm -hmm. Well, hey, keeps you sane, right? Yeah. And they had a whole department for the special forces in Okinawa that was called CISO. C I S O, and they made for them all kinds of gear, backpacks, ammunition pouches like these. These were CISO. Really? Still, okay. They, they didn't indicate any nation. Well, that's good though, you know. I mean, so you know, it kind of helped hide yourself in, yeah. in a sense, you know. And So they could deny anything. And this is, uh, I have to read it, I'm sorry. Ah. TRC3 detector set. They came in a bag of five with a little walkie-talkie kind of thing with an earpiece. Oh yeah. They, so kind of like that setup over there. Yes, and, correct. This is one of them. Stuff. I have two. And you would set them up like this in your perimeter at night. You would put the thorn in the ground right here. It's connected to your device with the antenna and everything. And you could set it on how loud you want it from all the way up to five, whatever. Okay. And you would hide it in, in, in the bush or what. And then you had your receiving end of it over here basically i have the radio and i leave it here and i walk over there you should hear a beeping sound okay you already hear it <laughs> people passing by you know it's probably catching up the rain huh you know yeah it, it made a made a good beep though but it's also probably catching the rain as well though the raindrops i'm, I'm Could sure be if it hits it right on top yeah but yeah this was basically a line of defense for them at night if you set five of them out in your perimeter one stays up 
has his earpiece in and listens and all making a different beep sound. This one makes one, this one makes three, there was one with two, four and five. So you would know, okay, I set my number three out in this direction. Okay, I know the enemy is coming from there or something is coming. I will wake up my, 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 my buddies. Okay, well that's pretty fascinating. I see. They play yep, now with catching the up over there. <laughs> okay. It's a and of course there's a camp right here. It's an intrusion detector. <laughs> so basically the phone takes your movement, uh -huh. vibration in the ground and sends out a signal. Oh wow. So they use them in Vietnam to fit over the perimeter perspective for coming up, moving a little bit, and then he can film it.